Okay, the sons of Ishar were Korah, is it Nepheg? Yep. Nepheg, and Zikri. Yep. The sons of Uziel were Mishael, Elzaphan, and Sithri. Yep. Aaron married El Elisheba, daughter of Amon, Aminadab, and sister of. <laughs> now, you guys are going to be nice. Nice now, Sean. Nah, Sean, right. And she bore him Nadab and Abihu, Eliezer and Ithamar. Okay, that particular sentence, does anybody know about uh, two of those four boys? Nadab, Abihu, Eliezer, and Ithamar? And names that are hard to pronounce. Other than their names being hard to pronounce. <laughs> were, were, they, were they the... Um, they were supposed to take... They're supposed to be the high priest, weren't they? Yes. And they were corrupt, weren't they? Well, no. They presented unauthorized fire before the Lord, Nadab and Abihu, and they were burnt to death in the exactly. presence of the Lord. It wasn't corrupt. It was just not following procedure. And it was a lesson for all high priests after that. So instead of them taking over the priesthood, the two brothers, uh, what are their names, um, Eleazar and Ithamar, became the, uh, you know, the, after Aaron. They, yeah. Eleazar succeeded Aaron. But that was the cost of not showing yourself holy in the presence of the Lord. And you'll find that, I believe, in Leviticus 10. And then in Leviticus 16, it describes the Day of Atonement and how careful. It's absolutely very, very precisely described. And for a reason. is because if they made a mistake in there, their life was forfeit. Uh, the high priest, which we're going to get to, um, the high priest had woven on the bottom of his garments pomegranate bell, pomegranate bell, pomegranate bell. Now, the Bible doesn't specifically say this, but it can be inferred that the bells are on there because if he dies in the Holy of Holies, they'll drag his body out, but they can't go in there. No. Okay? No. So, that is, it, it, it's a very, very precise ritual that they had to follow. Very precise. And that's the one I'll be speaking on in two weeks is the Day of Atonement. And boy, is there some symbolism in there. I mean, wow. Well, the symbolism uh, is all about Christ. All, all the feasts. That's why it had to be followed. That's right. All the priests, all of the feasts are very, very precise in what they say. But the Day of Atonement is really the day where the blood is shed and where mercy is granted. And so that one is very, very very detailed. An entire chapter of Leviticus is dedicated to just that. Yes? Seems like it's easier no. What's that? It seems like it's easier to stay alive in the age of grace. Though. Oh boy, I'm telling you what. Thank you for the dispensation of grace. You know, God really wanted the people to know. He wanted them to know who well, Jesus was. Sure, that's right. That's why he made it so... Precise. So absolutely. That's right. That's right, and it says right in the book of Hebrews, these were a copy of the heavenly things. Yes. And so... It was foreshadowing something much, much greater in heaven. Okay, go ahead, please. 24. 34? 24. Yeah. Okay, the sons of Korah were Asir, Elkanah, and Abiasa. These were the Korahite clans. Okay, now the Korahites are... Go ahead, we'll just go on from there for now. Eliezer, son of Aaron, married one of the daughters of Putiel, and she bore him Phineas. Phineas, Phineas. 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 okay. Phineas. These were the heads of the Levite families, clan by clan. Okay, anybody remember what Phineas did? We're not there yet, it's in the book of Numbers. Hophni and Phineas? Huh? Hophni and Phineas. Hophni and Phineas, yeah. Does, does, um, well, that's a different Phineas. Um, Hophni and Phineas were the sons of Eli, and yeah, they, they, they uh, ended up getting whacked in battle because of their disobedience. But this Phineas, I believe it's the same Phineas, and I, I may be wrong on this, but I believe it is. He's the one during the Midianites where they were uh, uh, the ball of Peor, and the Midianites were having the women commit sexual immorality. He's the one that grabbed the spear and thrust right through that one guy in Cosby, the girl, the daughter of the king of Midian. And so because of that, he was promised a priesthood. All right, so I believe that's the, the Phineas, and we can check that, but I'm pretty sure. Oh, it says right here, um, uh, no, Numbers 26, 11. We won't worry about that now. Okay, go ahead. We're at 26. Six. It, was this name, it was the same Aaron and Moses to whom the Lord said, Bring the Israelites out of Egypt by their divisions. 
They were the ones who spoke to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, about bringing the Israelites out of Egypt. It was the same Moses and Aaron. Well, they want you to know that. They? Yes, they do. <laughs> they, yes, they do. The same ones. The, the, those same ones. Not a different set. Okay, now when the Lord spoke to Moses in Egypt, he said to him, I am the Lord. Tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, everything I tell you. But Moses said to the Lord, since I speak with faltering lips, why would Pharaoh, Pharaoh listen to me? Yeah, that's exactly what he said at the burning bush. Okay, and he used the term, uh, this one uses the term uncircumcised lips. Now, I guarantee you, it says it I think three times in here. I guarantee you there's a wonderful chiasm that's hidden in there. And I went looking for it when I saw that. And I, I couldn't figure it out. I was just, you know, I didn't have a lot of time to do it. But I guarantee you that there is a beautiful chiasm in there between where he says it there and where he says it in Exodus 4. And if you look at it, I, I guarantee you there's something really beautiful. I just haven't had time to, to do it. Anybody wants to find a really be the first person in 3,500 years to see it, go from uncircumcised lips at 6.30, go back to 3.14, and you're going to find it. Anyway, go ahead. What says in here, faltering? Is that not faltering, same thing, different translation. Uncircumcised, faltering, or, yeah, same. Okay, then the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron, um, and your brother Aaron, will be your prophet. And that's exactly what he said before. He said the same thing. That's why I'm telling you there is this beautiful pattern in there. If you have the time and you've got, you know, sit down with your Bible and just start going back and forth and I'm sure it's in there. Go ahead. You are to say everything I command you and your brother Aaron is to tell Pharaoh to let the Israelites go out of this country. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart and though I mul multiply my miraculous signs and wonders in Egypt, he will not listen to you. Okay, now remember, if some of you were in the class yesterday, and I asked the question. He says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. Does God actively do that, or does, does God passively do that? I, I have a question based on yesterday. Okay. You were saying that, and I see your point, except for it says real clearly, um, I Saul, David, right. thing that God sent Saul... An evil spirit. Right. Okay. Now, once again, same thing. Was that actively God doing that? And uh, were you, he, he, I don't think you were here when we went to the account of uh, Ornan the Jebusite, where it says at the beginning of the account, uh, we did this a couple weeks ago, and I think it was at the end of the class, and you weren't here. So I'm going to show you something, and then this will help you understand that. Um, we need to go to the end of 2 Samuel. Okay, and it, it, it's important that you get this straight, and I'm not saying that God didn't actively harden their heart, but my feeling is that he passively allowed it to happen, that he is the one that worked his own heart into that, and God worked his miracles through him saying I'm going to do this, and it had an active consequence based on a passive uh, action by the Lord. Anyway, um, uh, uh, go to 2 Samuel 24 and read that. And then we want to go to, it was in, I think, 2 Chronic 1 Chronicles 21, I think. So you want to go to both of them. Um, 1 Chronicles, okay, 21. And I, what I want you to do is to read, Dave, read verse 2 Samuel 24, 1, and then read 1 Chronicles 21, 1. Okay, go ahead when you, when you find them. You want me to read the first one first? Then sure. The well, either one, whichever one you want. Which, the first verse in 24 1. Yes. Again, the anger of the Lord burned against Israel, and he incited David against them, saying, Go and take a census of Israel and Judah. Okay, now keep your finger there and go to 1 Chronicles 21 1 and read that one. Satan rose up against Israel and incited David to take a census. Of read, read it again. Uh, Satan was, Satan rose up against Israel and incited David to take a census of Israel. So do you see the difference? One says the Lord moved David against Israel and the other one says Satan rose up against Israel in the exact same account. Did you say a first chronicle? One chronicles 21 verse 1. And this is important because he hasn't been in here so yeah. it, it, during this particular talk. And I want you to 
to okay, Satan rose up against Israel and incited David to take a census of Israel. It's the exact same account. And one says the Lord rose, moved David to do it. And the other one says Satan rose up against it. And that shows you, in my opinion, that when the Lord does something, he is using other instruments to affect it. In other words, it's a, we can't attribute evil to the Lord. No. So what happened? It's just like when Satan went up to... Uh, uh, the Lord in Job and it says, you know, he's only uh, loves you because you're protecting him and the Lord allowed Satan to do the thing. Same thing here. Was it the Lord that actively worked against David or was it the Lord passively allowing this to happen? And that's what I believe is the case. If not, then we're attributing evil to the Lord. Yeah. And it's... Well, in the case of Saul, Saul had gotten so corrupted. Yeah. Right. That the Lord said, have it your way. Exactly. That's what I believe is the case in every instance. And I, 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 the reason why is because if the Lord actively hardened Pharaoh's heart, then you're back to what the praetors believe in. Yeah. Were you in class when I showed the duck thing? Okay. That God is actually taking ducks out of the river and letting the uh, others go to hell. I don't believe that. And that's not the doctrine of Grace Baptist Church. Grace Baptist Church says that the duck voluntarily swims to the side of the thing and goes onto the the uh, the bank. And the other ducks that don't want to accept God, they just keep doing their own thing right down the river. Yeah, okay? Quack. Yeah, quack, quack. Yeah. Ah, flack. That's right. Oh. So that's just how I perceive that because I don't want to ever attribute something to God that I think we can work around. <laughs> oh. All right, so anyway, that's just my opinion on those very difficult verses. It doesn't mean I'm right, but look, every time you come to one of those, look through it and think it through, and hopefully, you know, they'll be resolved where you won't have a conflict in your personal self. In me, I just attribute everything to free will. I, I, I believe that God is sovereign, 100% sovereign, but he allows us to make our own beds. That's what I believe. And so once God starts interfering in our free will, then all of a sudden we really don't have free will. And right. to me that, 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 you know, as I said though, and might as well bring this up because I've got the tape rolling and I don't want anybody that ever listens to this to think that, that a prophet has a different quality in him that we, than we have. Okay? So when a prophet like Jeremiah says, I am weary of holding his word in and indeed I cannot, that's because he was born with a quality of speaking the word of the Lord. And as just as we need water or we will die, just as we need food or we will die, a prophet has free will to not speak the word of the Lord. Jeremiah did that. He stopped speaking the word of the Lord and then eventually says, I'm going to die if I don't speak the word of the Lord. So that is a quality in him that we just don't have, everybody. All right? So I, go I know you do. All right. Have a good one. Anyway, there you go. And each of us, I'm sure individually has a particular quality that the Lord has instilled in us. Something that we need to either overcome or something that we can't overcome because He wants this done in our life. That doesn't negate our free will. It just means that He is working out His plan for humans. Yeah. And He is giving us a choice. We can either do this or we can suffer the consequences. And that is certainly the case in Paul and in Jeremiah and in Amos. These people were given a choice. They didn't have to do it, but they felt compelled to do it. Paul says, yeah. I, indeed, I am compelled yeah. to preach the gospel. Yeah. It was a quality in him. So you get one of these uh, preachers is up there that never misses a preaching day in his whole life. God probably put it on his heart that you're going to preach the gospel or you're going to kick off. You know, <laughs> whatever. I don't know. But we all have something in us, whether we realize it or not, that God is using to direct us through our lives. Anyway, Pharaoh had one too. Go ahead. When Pharaoh does not listen to you, then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring out my host, my people, the sons of Israel, from the land of Egypt by great judgments. So he knew in advance, Pharaoh's not going to listen to him, definitely not going to do it. And he's saying, when this happens, so Moses needs to be patient. Remember we went through last week where the people were already incited against Moses. Look at the trouble you've brought upon us. Well... In order for them, for the Lord to be more glorified, they have to go through that trouble. They've got to go through the ten plagues. If not, then the redemption is just, oh, look at the Lord got us out and everything is fine. But when they go through the trials and all of these tests and Egypt is utterly laid waste, the Lord has got a lot more glory from it.